So welcome. Um, my name is Sushi. Nobody knows my real name anyways. And um, I haven't written my own web framework yet. So we have a dozen or so in Perl. Maybe I get some day to it. So um, one of the reasons I'm doing this talk is because um, I evaluate web frameworks basically on a monthly basis for curiosity reasons mostly, to see what other, other languages do, what, what's out there. And um, over the years, I collected a couple of web frameworks works which just do interesting things in different ways than the web frameworks we are usually using. So, but let me first remind you why we are actually having web, framework, um, web frameworks. Who did web before 2000? And who did web already around 95, 96? Okay, so um, let me remind we, you where we are coming from actually. Um, so does anybody remember the GIF patent discussion, for example, when we thought about removing GIFs from websites? Um, image maps, anyone? S server site includes? <laughs> Wonderful. Hidden fields? Lots of hidden fields? So then somebody invented <laughs> Mod Perl. Um, the world put sessions into URLs, if you remember <laughs> this time. And then we got PHP, FE, and MSQL. So um, then remember the great times of XML. Let me remind you of this. Then we got actually CSS, and the use of tables became frowned upon. We stopped writing HTML tags in capital letters at some point, <laughs> and everybody hated the use of JavaScript. There was a time when JavaScript was totally a no-go because um, it wouldn't work anyway, so nobody used it. So then something weird happened around 2000, and people started to love JavaScript. And at some point, um, we got things like Rails and jQuery and, of course, unicorns. Um, and everything had to be pretty all of a sudden, so there was a huge shift in usability and web design as well. And that's quite an interesting part because several things started to coincide at the same time. You left out the blink oh, I'm so sorry, and Marquis, I actually, I actually have in my user content CSS of Firefox um, that blank, uh, blink tag and marquee does not work. So. <laughs> So what we are having now um, over the last four years, um, all browsers support now CSS3 and HTML5. And um, so, but there's still some quirks altogether. So um, early frameworks in Perl, and I actually call CGIPM a framework because we used to generate entire web sites with CGIPM. And I actually worked for a company which uses CGIPM as its rendering engine. No, no, don't laugh about that. As its rendering engine for a widget system written in Perl, which serves HTML via CGIPM because you have this convenient opening and closing tags. So that's quite nice. There's CGI application. We have um, Mason 2 by now. There was Maple, for example, and at least five, ten other varieties of handling CGI and generating HTML in some way or another. HTML yeah, for example, there, there is, uh, it, it has been a web time where most frameworks worked in a way that you would generate um, HTML and somehow handle forms. So, because that was it, website-wise. So, um, did websites actually change, really? So, if you look at Gmail, for example, is this really a different website than 10 years ago? Well, they are called differently. What is really new is the broad variety of websites you have today. Um, for example, um, enterprise domain-specific specialized stuff, which is for closed user base, which doesn't have to care about search engine, engine optimization. It's very common in Germany, for example, to have these kinds of web business, which nobody knows of because it's totally specialized. And we have all the social stuff like Facebook, Twitter, you name it, and so on. We have still the everyday company web 
page which contain, doesn't contain a lot, but still it's five pages, and the form to send an email, for example. We have lots of shopping in a lot of varieties, big, small, in all kinds of things. We now have a lot of services. Um, there's an amazing um, aggregator of um, web APIs. It's called Programmable Web. I can highly recommend it because they collect like for eight years or ten years all kinds of APIs. It's really a great site and you can um, filter them by returning XML, using JSON, whatever. Um, and we are now starting to write APIs ourselves. So um, who was at the previous talk about Ox? Um, I'm basically writing the exact same thing like he does, but with different Perl tools. So it's an, it's in the back, it's an API which serves JSON to a very complex front end. So this would be another shift in web stuff. Um, the back end suddenly gets dumber, gets a lot leaner and a lot smaller. It gets service oriented, and I really don't care if you call it service oriented architecture or microservices. Um, it is reduced down to an HTTP service which serves RESTful or not data in one format or another. So, um, and it's, I agree with him, it's quite nice for the backend people because you can stop caring about templating. So, um, is it more complicated than before or is it not? If you look into today's JavaScript frameworks, and um, as much as I love to rant about them, because there's like two dozen, and he's right, um, I also tweeted the JavaScript frameworks are like tribbles um, <laughs> thing. Um, there is down under, there is still the same stuff. It's really form handling, it's still HTTP. Um, it's still making the back button work in some way or another. It's still faking state somehow or having sessions. It's still input validation, authentication and authorization. And now it even has to look good and behave nicely. So, um, But there is a reason why the shift into complex JavaScript happens. Because now ja um, applications in browsers are actually as capable as desktop applications. I'm collecting, for example, um, first-person shooter in JavaScript, which are an amazing example because you have to update so fast visuals because you're running through the dungeon, of course. Um, there's physics engines, uh, totally amazing examples of bouncing balls around and really, really, really great stuff. So. What do we have today, actually? So there's kind of the mother of modern web frameworks, in my opinion, which would be Rails today. And um, then there's this classification of um, the big web frameworks, like Rails, Django, Catalyst, and the so-called micro frameworks, like Zinatra, and um, in Python, it's, for example, Flask. Um, in Perl, it's, of course, Dancer and Mojolicious, and so on. So there's now a very broad variety um, of frameworks which are still work very much the same way. Also JavaScript has now, thanks to Node.js, um, a lot of server-side frameworks, so you can knock yourself out with two dozens of those. Um, if you're really interested into how web frameworks can be done, look into Meteor and Derby for the JavaScript side, because they are trying to go a different way of model view controller based frameworks. But they are quite heavy stuff and you really should know JavaScript if you look into them. So mm, then of course Java has its totally own class of web frameworks which are extensively used, especially for example in Germany. There's lots of um, companies which do web completely in Java. Um, they are quite interesting because they work entirely differently than anything you know from Perl, Python, Ruby, you name it. Okay, and then there's PHP and this has frameworks too and that's all I have to say about this. <laughs> so mm, the interesting part is actually that really literally every language has a framework these days and I really mean every language. It's starting to be the canonical 
tutorial if you learn a new programming language that you start writing a web, web application in it, which is kind of weird because it's not it's a very niche thing for most languages in the end. Um, on the other hand, you already know web or you believe you know web. So when I say everybody one has one these days, I really mean it. So let me start with, for example, small talk. Who has ever did small talk? That's a lot of people, actually. <laughs> um, who knows the statistic thing R that has a web framework? <laughs> and yes, I'm really not kidding. Haskell has a web framework. Um, Erlang has, for example, Web Machine, which is so interesting that it got adopted in a couple of languages. And COBOL has now CGI support. <laughs> and no, I'm not joking, I'm not joking. If you install Open COBOL, it's really that big on their website that it now has CGI support. Um, I didn't look up uh, if Forth or Postscript has web frameworks, but my guess would be actually yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, why? I, I'm totally not surprised. So uh, I'm, I, I remember actually websites written in Bash scripts back in the day. So um, and MST loves Tickle. So um, there has been a lot of web stuff in Tickle, for example, um, in uh, in in Germany. And there's also a lot of web stuff um, in Lua, especially on embedded devices. Who's who knows a Fritz box? and has one. Lua on the web service you connect to the f and configure your router. So mm, what is interesting about web frameworks these days, so usually you use in Perl, Mojulicious, Dancer, Catalyst, um, he uses Ox, um, I'm using Web Machine these days for example, so how do I actually categorize like two dozen web frameworks? So um, we have this canonical application, which is, of course, servant cat pictures, which I implemented in Mojolicious, Dancer, Flask, and Sinatra, which is simply the typical cat picture web application. You can input um, your username, and then you get a really, really cute kid. Thanks a lot. I am totally going for more than one hour per 10 minutes. So. You, of course, have links. Um, that's the standard form. There's some kind of pseudo error handling. So if your username is too short, you don't get a kitty. Um, if you totally forget to enter anything, you actually get all kitties. So <laughs> let me go through this. Um, and that's the same thing in Flask, for example, which really should on your the site you are seeing should, of course, be the same. But let me remind you that the only thing I could actually exchange between four web frameworks was the cascading style sheet style file, not the templates, not the backend. If I would be serving these cat pictures from a database, for example, I would be, of course, using in Perl DBE or DBX class. Um, I would be using uh, in Python, um, um, I forgot how their ORM is called, but um, I would use PsychoPG, for example. In Ruby, I would use Active Record, for example, or their DBI, and so on, and so on, and so on. And there would be my SQL somehow integrated. But it would always be the same SQL, probably. So, but I can't really abstract this away, so the only thing which is really honestly reusable is the cascading style sheet file, which of course is today usually very large and very complicated because you actually try to do nice websites. So um, that's the same thing in Sinatra. It's sti still very, very cute cat pictures. Um, this, by the way, is, in my opinion, the cutest of them all. <laughs> I actually have that as a printout at home. So mm, all these web frameworks um, This is how it looks in Python with Flask as the web framework and with Jinja as the templating engine. So everybody not knowing Python should be able, coming from other languages, to actually read this. Um, 
this is, for example, how it looks in Sinatra with um, Slim. Slim is coming from JavaScript, and it's called Jade in JavaScript. But it really is, um, if you look at it, it's really not that difficult. It looks very clean and very clutterless, which is the nice thing about Ruby, for example, and the nice thing about Jade and Slim as a templating engine. It's very reduced. So um, here we have the same thing in Dancer with um, Template Toolkit. And here we have the same thing in Mojolicious with, with Mojo's native templates. So um, you actually would have to look closely on a very basic level um, to see the difference between Dancer and Mojolicious in Perl code. So um, let me uh, really rub it in. This is your roots in four different web frameworks and um, three different programming languages. So um, there is really no big difference. It would look the same, for example, basically in ExpressJS um, in the JavaScript web, um, web framework. If you look how you grab your parameters, it's also really not that difficult. It, that's, that's the big difference between Dancer and Mojolicious at a glance. Really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I also, um, in Sinatra, I named the variable accidentally differently. So um, that's a really huge difference. So if you look at the templating systems, for example, Jinja, Slim Jade, um, Template Toolkit, and Mojo, there's also not really much of a difference. Um, handlebar and Mustache looks like Jinja, and I'm not really sure if Jinja actually is a Mustache um, implementation. Um, then uh, Slim Jade has just different varieties how you resolve, resolve your variable in the template. Um, there's also a Perl implementation of all of this stuff. Uh, if it's not Perl anyways, um, then Template Toolkit uses um, the, uh, whatever they are called in English, the Eckige Klammern brackets, exactly, and uh, Mojo, for example, uses the, how are those called? Angle brackets. Angle brackets, and so uh, there's, uh, it's always brackets of some kind, one way or another. Sometimes some special character like percent, um, and that's your templating system. So the difference in the templatings is, for example, if they, they support um, if it's branches one way or another, or looping over stuff and all those kinds of things. So, okay, so it, it, it's four different web frameworks, but it's really not much of a difference. And if you put, would put Django, um, Catalyst, and Rails examples next to it, um, if you would tweak Catalyst into more restful root, traditional roots, um, it wouldn't even look much different than this. So um, the devil of these kinds of web frameworks is really in the detail how handle they validation, um, do they have any kind of helpers, for example, which is uh, the nice stuff um, uh, some web frameworks have. How do you deal with sessions, how is your model integrated, um, are there nice things um, for authentication and authorization, do they have some kind of plug-in stuff, um, how is the documentation, best practices, the community, and so on and so on. So that's basically the distinguishing things lie in this, but not in the concept of the web framework. So um, is there actually any way different to do web stuff and there's two different ways to think about a web application in my opinion. The first one is basically very loosely coupled, very raw and you usually use it to think about um, web stuff as services. Um, you usually have a very high level of control over the entire request and response thing, however it is implemented. And um, one highly recommended article is um, Steve Yegi's Amazon service rant. It's a long rant um, how different the culture at Amazon and Google is. And he goes extensively uh, on and on about um, how Amazon switched uh, internally to a service-oriented architecture. And it's really, really interesting and a really worthwhile article to read because there's really a lot of merit to do this stuff this way. And they did it 
pretty early and on a very huge scale, of course. So then there's a totally different kind of web frameworks, which are highly integrated. Java web frameworks usually work more this way. They are very application-oriented in a traditional sense of uh, an application on your desktop, which is basically mapped into the browser. Um, they are a lot more like um, traditional GUI programming. Um, they usually don't make you touch HTML and CSS. They are often component-based. Um, they are usually coming with everything out of the box. Um, and sometimes, why would I even bother with templates when I can do it differently? So, mm, examples of the very loosely surfacey thing is, for example, Erlang's web machine which also has an implementation in Ruby, Perl, and Node, and possibly somewhere else, which I don't know uh, about. Back in the day, actually Mod Perl, which really gave you a very high control over anything and everything. Um, and today also Mongrel, 2, Mongrel 2, which is actually a web server officially, but it is kind of cool because um, you, set, uh, you can set up your root um, to a handler which points to a 0MQ handler, which is, in my opinion, a really cool concept, so I could have made a kitty service. <laughs> so, um, totally different way, and I re really mean totally different, is, um, for example, Smalltalk Seaside, and also Ars Shiny. Those are Look, look different, the languages are different, the concept is different, you program it totally differently, and um, they are more oriented to push out very fast and very productively an entire application with a graphical user interface. So, let's take a look how this really looks and how this really works. Web machine, conceptually, um, is basically that you have your resource in the restful term of resource. You have your resource and then the web machine goes over um, uh, 50 steps um, which are in an insanely huge flowchart diagram at the origination of um, web machine at Riak Basho which used Erlang and, and basically invented it. So you go um, over the complete request and response cycle and you have a range of functions or methods um, where you can step by step plug in your interaction for the request and response ping pong per resource. This sounds totally weird and totally complicated, but it's so simple that it makes it totally complicated to understand. So um, I'm also serving, of course, kitties with web machine. And there's actually, um, I hacked like um, eight mini web applications in seven different languages in 10 evenings, so it makes you going insane anyways. But for example, um, I didn't manage to serve an image in web machine, and um, so if you type in here, it works in general, but because I have to do weird things in web machine, um, I didn't manage it. So what Web Machine does, it it gives you around 50 methods. Um, this is the Perl implementation, by the way, by Stephen Little, so um, enjoy it. Um, it gives, gives you a range of interaction points. For example, I'm using POST, of course, to submit my form. And you declare that one of the allowed methods in HTTP you are going to use on this specific resource is going to be post. So my kitty resource allows get and post because I'm serving a list of kitties and I'm um, getting the uh, username as an input. But then I have to implement actually a process post to actually do something with a post. And that's the whole thing of web machine is I say which content types I'm going to provide. And um, for example, CSS and HTML is both a, both a content type. And I actually have to implement a ZOOP um, to actually fill these kinds of content types with the proper stuff. 
So in case of CSS and HTML, it's of course text. But in case of images, it has to be a binary and content type um, image PNG, image GIF, image JPEG, and whatever browsers today understand or don't understand. So um, it's very mm, it's very manual. So here I'm try I try to serve a GIF, for example, um, and I try to return uh, my cat picture, which comes from a variable because I try to randomly serve cat pictures to make things, things more complicated. Um, I, I tried to serve a binary file. So something doesn't really work, so I don't get my cat picture, and I really don't know why. Um, and because it was a tiny example for a talk, um, I didn't really debug it. Um, but here you, see, um, here you see how I am serving CSS with CSS tiny, so it just gets dropped out um, in this uh, method as a string and gets served by a web machine properly as it's supposed to be. And in the template, the usual load this CSS file is still entailed, but I have to ha do the, the serving manually, basically. So mm, what makes web machine really cool is the insane high control you suddenly get over the complete request response cycle. It's like 50 methods which you can use and or not use. You don't have to use all of it, plus about 20 helpers um, to create your web serving thing. Um, Stephen has written like a dozen examples which do all kinds of stuff and his base was um, actually to do rest properly so um, he has a very nice talk about it um, rest in the trenches or th something like this um, and there's uh, more explanation how you actually deal with web machine because it, it looks simple and you think you know HTTP but um, at least I thought and I obviously don't um, you can do whatever you want with it, and um, you can do combine it with whatever you like. And also, Stephen Little is now called Damn It Stephen, for whatever reasons. But they started it at the Yapsi in North America, so we are adopting it now here. So um, the problem with Web Machine is, of course, you have to do everything by hand, and I really mean you have to. It just does not work. Um, you better really know HTTP, and uh, it's kind of an advantage and a disadvantage. You need to combine it with all kinds of tools, which means um, in Perl you have, I don't know, over a hundred, I don't know, a dozen templating systems you c could use or not use, depending if you surf HTML or not, and all kinds of stuff. So it will look differently for, any, for everybody. Um, Mongrel 2 um, is this concept root pointing to a zero M MQ handler, which is so insanely cool because I totally love zero MQ. Um, it's very services, service, serv you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> it's a bit weird. It stores stuff in SQLite. Um, the configuration file is um, like Python code, um, which I really don't like. For example, BuildBot does the same thing because Python is so simple, so we just do our config files in it. Um, it looks like this, and this is, it, it's just lovely. I love it. And I want this, please, in Perl. Somebody, so anybody, go and this is what I want. Maybe a bit more fancy, but please, in this simple syntax, here's my root and there's my handler, and now do your stuff. Um, when would you use these kinds of things? They are great for APIs. They are really shitty for full-blown UE-heavy real applications. Um, when you really, really want REST all the way, and trust me, um, I'm laboring over REST for two years now, and it's so insanely simple that it's so insanely difficult to get right. It's really, but when you get it right, it's really just beautiful. So um, also, it's very nice when you hate everything else and want to roll your own, and of course, because you can. Um, so something totally different. Uh, three people have actually used Smalltalk. Um, GNU Smalltalk for people who can type, or Smalltalk Smalltalk? 
Okay. So, mm, small talk is um, they invented everything. Let me remind you of this. So, object orientation, graphical user interfaces, um, what we know as roles. Um, comes from small talks as traits, and they call it little units of behavior, which is so lovely. Small talk has a total knack for it to explain things really nice. What's a meta class? Yeah, well, everything is an object, so our class can be an object too, and it just has methods, period. That's what small talk has to say about the seemingly complex subject of a meta class. It's really, and of course, it exists in small talk, and they have um, observer pattern is natively in all objects, and you name it. So um, it is kind of a niche thing. There's really not a, a lot of people, but they still have two web frameworks, and I'm going to show you two. Um, let me first show you how this really looks in small talk. Um, if you are not using GNU Smalltalk, which has text-based files, this is how Smalltalk looks for decades. You have an, it's an image-based language, like Lisp, for example. So you power this thing up, and then you program on the open heart. It's totally amazing. You can change anything and everything, and you have um, the, there's a workspace, which is um, their REPL, kind of. And um, you're programming in this thing, which is basically a class browser and, and anything you can imagine. And it has refactoring tools and debugging stuff. And it's really, um, if you re really want to do object oriented right, really go for small talk. And it's, if it's just for a couple of weeks, really do it. It's, it's totally amazing. So um, this is my Super Kitty class which has, for, among other th things, a method, render content on, and a couple of other methods. And this is um, the, they treat um, HTML as methods. And when Smalltalk says everything is a method, they really, really mean it. It's really, it's totally different. Um, so the cool thing about the framework is that Smalltalk is all about um, service for the programmer. It's really, um, you would edit, for example, this class in your class browser and then just um, compile it to the image. Then you, of course, reload your website. But um, it, I don't know Smalltalk that well, so this is highly experimental. And I found a bug in one implementation, and wow. the other didn't work with this framework. So. The really cool thing is I can also edit my entire web application in the browser live. So you switch basically into kind of a into kind of a, a developer mode and then you get a class browser in your browser. So and yet now let me change something in a meth method. I'm changing the title. So my amazing super kitties are now amazing ultra cute super kitties. So um, I accept it. It's kind of slow sometimes. And I close it or not, whatever. So here's my updated page title. And now the really cool thing is um, it is also updated in my class on the server. And vice versa. It's totally, it totally doesn't matter where you edit your web application. And it's really, you look at a complex graphical user interface, you think, oh, this button has to be two pixels to the right. You edit it directly on the page by switching into a developer mode, and the entire thing transpires directly onto the server into your classes, in your class browser. Imagine you would edit in Firefox with some kind of editing mode, your CSS directly, and suddenly your 
um, Perl code in um, VI on the server would be updated. This is the equivalent. They're achieving this, um, Smalltalk, is, as I said, is image-based. They're achieving this with um, so-called continuations. And basically, every object in your web page has kind of a connection and identifier. Seriously? Oh my god. Um, connection and identifier to the server, so, okay. But this is really cool, so, um, <laughs> editing both, no, it's, it really, let it sit for a second, editing both ways, it's a totally amazing feature. Um, so, um, you have to do small talk. So, um, yeah, if you know small talk, so haha, -ha, okay. Um, then ask shiny, and this is, it's really shiny. Sorry, I'm wrong again. Uh, I'm having a bad day. You have 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, this is, this is really, we're talking about, about this statistics thing. Yeah, I'm very proud of my collection of really good cat pictures, so. Um, and please, <laughs> Um, have a look at the title here, Have Your Kitty, because what <laughs> Shiny can do, hmm, so it automatically updates on the fly. Choose a different kitty, username stays persistent, <laughs> you change the name again, kitty still stays per persistent and um, this, of course, um, if you now don't feel relaxed, I really can't help you. I totally <laughs> can't. This is... So, um, also very interesting is um, the code is extremely short. Um, what you do is you declare a server part and an UI part and on the server happens all the stuff um, you do with your data. Um, you also declare, basically, what is, in the end, supposed to be rendered on the UI part. So if I he have here my caption, which is a simple render text, of course, because what else would a caption, in the end, really be? Um, I output it um, on the UI part um, in a specific place of the page. And the interesting thing about Shiny is it's, it's of course, a very special interest web framework, but um, the reflective part is the interesting part. The live update part is the interesting part, and Shiny has, um, I think, 30 examples of interactive charts on their web page where you just take your data and shove some things around and input new stuff and mm, change the values and all this kinds. And all this gets live updated directly in your charts. And it's, it's, it can't be shorter and simpler to whip up something which visual, visualizes uh, um, your data. It's really, um, if you have to do this stuff, it's a lot simpler than GNU plot. It's a not, lot simpler than 3D JS, which is really amazing. Um, D3, sorry, um, which is an amazing charting library by the New York Times. So the New York Times brought us more than Devil Nutprof. Um, well, it's R, so, and, which you actually don't have really t to know. That's the amazing thing. It's a statistics environment where the programming language is totally pushed into the background. If you look into books about R or tutorials, it's all about its usage, and there's maybe like two pages in the entire book about programming this stuff. So you really can play around with this and it's also image based so the REPL and uh, the live updates are extremely powerful. It's really cute and they are our biggest fans by the way because they still use a lot of Perl underneath for example for um, reading in Excel files for regular expression stuff and you don't want to look at the tutorials of R how you deal with regular expression. It, it's like the last 15 years didn't happen. 
Um, they have they have something like CPAN. It's called CRUN, and their modules are called CRUNberries. It's so cute. I love it. Um, now, if you're even remotely interested into data things, shiny, and just for the name, please, shiny is really what you want to try. Um, so. Yeah, that's a total special interesting, and it has a lot of magic um, behind this. So it's really, um, it uses bootstrap and a lot of different things to make the output easier. But it works really well. So when would you use something like Smalltalk Seaside or the L thing? Um, productivity and with web aptitude. It's really fast and productive to develop an application with these kinds of tools. I just want this little thing. Totally great for this. You hate templates. You don't use templates. We have this big enterprise thing running now for 15 years, which never does get any external stuff, new things. So you basically write your own kind of highly integrated web framework. Um, and of course, because you can. And you should, because it's really new and different. So there's a couple of other concepts to actually steal from. Um, what I noticed in almost all functional programming languages, they don't bother which, with HTML and CSS. They just wrapped it into the language. Um, R does the same thing, Smalltalk does the same thing. So if you're, if you're templating something, it's actually functional method calls, which is kind of nicer because it's less typing and it behaves differently and, in my opinion, more logically. So this is really something um, people interested in web frameworks should look at. There's also the concept of CouchDB to just HTTP basically directly onto your database and serve your stuff. And for um, I've used CouchDB for a couple of smaller web applications, and it's really nice. It's, uh, it's of course, JavaScript all the way, but it's really nice. Um, you get a lot of features directly out of CouchDB, for example, paging or ranges on your stuff come directly out of CouchDB, um, s basic sorting of some things. Um, Tim Bunce has written something remotely, really remotely similar with um, a combination of Debic and Web Machine. Um, you take your schema and directly serve it via Web Machine, basically. So, um, I didn't try it, I was just pointed to it, but it, it really is a similar concept. And if you really just want to grab some of your data from your database, why on earth would you bother with this huge middle chunk in the middle? So, and then there's of course the, my favorite question, templates really, um, why can't I have real widgets like in real GUI programming? I'm supposed to program complex graphical user interfaces these days and not just whip up five lines of HTML. Templating systems just added more complexity. So now they allow it to loop me, but they make things complex in a view, which is a bad thing. A view should be dumb and render stuff, so in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. So if I would say what's the good and the bad stuff about things, Flask in particular is extremely well documented. It has a great tutorial, the big mega Flask tutorial. Whip aptitude, shiny, unbeatable, and I really don't I, I don't have to know R, that's really the point. Um, Modulicious is really nice because it has a couple of um, surrounding helpers and functions which make things kind of smoother. Um, cool feature, this client-server editing is, um, why, why does nobody else have that? I think a couple of JavaScript frameworks try it, but it's really just not the same and it's really amazing in, in, in Seaside. Just for this feature, really try it. Um, the nicest community, of course, goes to Dancer with our <laughs> lovely vegan sparkling coat princess. Why, why am I wearing a vegan shirt today? Because you know that I would put this into my slide. <laughs> exactly. So um, my personal taste, um, web machine, I don't really get it yet, but it, my gut says <laughs> it's cool. So <laughs> the totally logical business de decision is, of course, to try web machine. Yes, five minutes. Um, Genuine. Okay, yeah. 
Um, and then there's uh, the, the shortcut thing and CouchDB, and I really can recommend to actually try it. So um, famous last words. Um, in the end, the entire cool stuff is, of course, totally worthless if it's buggy, broken, not really used in the wild. You have no docs, no folklore about it, no community to speak of, totally too alien that you actually can wrap your head around it. Doesn't play with other th um, makes make this kind of small talk try to make it into JIT. It does its own versioning stuff. It only got recently a way to actually make text out of their image stuff and these kinds of things. And then, remember, does anybody remember the Reddit rewrite when they um, pushed out Lisp and switched to Python? Was it Reddit or was it Dick? One of these sites, pushed out Lisp, and um, they have a huge article about it, so um, read it up, and switched to Python. Reasoning, not because Lisp wasn't cool enough, no, of course not, because of the environment. The modules existed in Python and not in Lisp. It was smoother to do this stuff in Python. So that's, a, and that's where we, in my opinion, really shine. Um, if you don't know the term worse is better, Google it and read it. It's really, really a must read for every software developer. I really mean it. Worse is better, just Google it and read it. So um, after all that, I can tell you after these 10 days of hacking this stuff and finding bugs and not working and it's all confusing and seven different templating systems, we have it so, so good in Perl. Re really go through the other stuff and then go back to Perl. It's all so smooth and so easy and so fluffy and it's really, uh, no, I really mean it. It's, it's completely different and um, I don't know how many of you program a lot of different languages, um, but it's, uh, we are so fucking smooth. It's <laughs> so thank you very much. And this, people, is how cat pictures really are really made and make it to the internet. This is how it works. <laughs> We have about three or four minutes for questions, if anyone would like to. Uh, well, so first announcement is that um, at 13.50 there will be a room change. So we will have, our first talk will still be in here in the web track, and the next talk in the web track, which is uh, Sawyer's talk on Dancer, will be upstairs in Musala. And uh, David? It's a plaque talk. Oh, sorry, on, on plaque, we'll be, we'll be in this room. Uh, and yeah, uh, equally, if you wanted to see David Verdin's talk on Simper, at that time, that will be in this room here. Okay, a any questions? Is the live schedule updated? The, the live schedule is updated, but, but the paper ones aren't, because there's too many copies. <laughs> okay. So I I if there aren't questions, then please grab Sue. Uh, during the break, and thanks again for a great so, talk. So um, code and slides are already in my GitHub, um, and I will tweet it, and um, just go through the code, you get a feeling for what it really does, and I accidentally submitted all my cat pictures four times into GitHub, and I will remove those, because um, <laughs> I was really tired. <laughs>